that's another one I really hate when businesses seem to actively make it difficult for you to contact them because they don't want to deal with customer service inquiries. Welcome to Honest Ecommerce, a podcast dedicated to cutting through the BS and finding actionable advice for online store owners. I'm your host, Chase Clymer, and I believe running a direct-to-consumer brand does not have to be complicated or a guessing game. On this podcast, we interview founders and experts who are putting in the work and creating real results. I also share my own insights from running our top Shopify consultancy, Electric Eye. We cut the fluff in favor of facts to help you grow your e-commerce business. Let's get on with the show. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Honest E-Commerce. And today, bringing to the show a very, very smart gentleman, Will Lorenson. Will's coming to us from Customers Who Click. He is just a genius when it comes to customer value, customer lifetime value, value optimization. Uh, and that's kind of all that they do over there at Customers Who Click. Will, welcome to the show. Hi. Thanks for having me. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Uh, I feel like we haven't spoken a long time. Yeah. So uh, for those in the know, I was literally just... Uh, we just recorded uh, an episode of Customers Who Click um, on Tuesday, I do believe. And this is Thursday. Yep. So uh, maybe they'll come out at the same time. And we'll just blast the universe with all of our knowledge. Yeah. Be good. Awesome. So take me back to the beginning. Um, what what kind of got you into e-commerce? Uh, and and you know where did, where did kind of your consultancy come from? Yeah, sure. So... Um, my background originally was in a few startups, uh, a few B2C startups. And uh, my role was kind of a general marketing person, uh, as you kind of are in, in startups. Um, and what I found was quite often we were given large budgets and told, go and spend this money, go acquire customers. And that was basically the entirety of, of the remit for the marketing team. Just launch those acquisition channels, uh, spend the money. There were actually cases where we were told, if you don't spend the money, you're not getting it next month. So on the one hand, you're like, well, I don't want to waste money because I don't want to spend it. And they're like, well, yeah, but you need to spend it. We're giving you that budget to spend. If you don't spend it, it means you can't and we won't give it to you next time. That's basically what happens with the military budgets here in America. And that's why they keep getting bigger. They just find ways to spend it. Yeah. Um, so... Yeah, obviously, when you're at startups, you know, the product is not complete. All right. So you have to work a bit harder to engage customers. Um, you have to figure out those, the problems, um, pretty, pretty quickly. And what I was finding was that we weren't right. You know, the product team had their roadmap to, to work on and it was just, you know, it was like years worth of work. And that was it. That was their plan. Um, so marketing team just keep marketing. Use email to, to bring people back. Just do what you can. And I had this a few times and it was getting quite frustrating. And I started to push myself more and more into the product team and said, look, I'm going to work with you because I'm seeing all the feedback coming in from customers. I'm seeing the engagement rates, uh, in our apps and our products with our products. Um, we have to be, you know, improving the app or improving the website, um, in, improving the actual, the, purchase journey itself um, to the point where the purchase is completed, but then also uh, less product related, but what can we do after that purchase to actually retain people, to make them happy and to make sure that, you know, they're actually going to come back to us. They're going to talk about us. Um, they're going to leave good reviews. They're going to refer friends to us. And so I left my last job as head of conversion for a gaming company in the UK uh, about 18 months ago. Um, and set out on my own to, to work with e-commerce brands to do this. So to help them, you know, optimize their websites for conversion, get those people, you know, through the door making that purchase. But then also, what does that later experience look like? How do we, how do we make sure that we're, we're not just treating them all as one big batch of customers and that we're doing our best to not only personalize the experience one to one, but just generally give that great experience to people? Yeah, that's fantastic. And I think it's, um, Something that sets apart, you know, generalists from an an agency or a consultancy contract, whatever you want to call it, um, the, from the rest of the pack is when they have like a, a kind of a north star with all their engagements, uh, and, and you know, yours is quite clearly, you know, customer lifetime value. Yeah. Just with that being said, customer lifetime value is a very interesting uh, metric, and there's quite a few ways to kind of calculate it. 
I guess. So for those uh, listening that are you know a little bit newer to e-commerce and you know they may not have uh, their customer lifetime value figured out, you know, is there you know a basic formula that you throw out there for for the newbies, or you know, is your formula pretty easy to understand? You know, how do you how do you kind of calculate these things? Um, so a, a basic formula would be um, you know taking the amount uh, total amount spent dividing it by the number of customers. Um, however. The key thing to then do, or to do first, I suppose, is is actually split that out at least a bit by channels and and some other segmentation, because you know what you'll find is if you take an average, you you might get some, you might get a handful of people who are spending tens of thousands on your website, but the majority of people are spending a hundred dollars, um, either over their lifetime or per purchase, whatever. But if you take it as an average, you suddenly get an average of five hundred dollars, for example, or a thousand, which means that when you start planning for your acquisition and setting your budgets and things, you're you're targeting CPAs with a an acquisition cost that's so much higher than you actually can afford to do. So it's really really important that you split that out by channel. You you use a bit of um, kind of RFM modeling to to understand what those different value segments are as well. Because yeah, if if you don't do that, you, you've got no idea what you're really targeting on. What is uh what is RFM modeling? Oh, so recency, frequency, monetary. So it's kind of scoring people based on uh, how recently they made a purchase, how frequently they purchase, and how much they spend. Gotcha. So all of this is an exercise in kind of you you have all your data and now you're cleaning up the data uh, it, with the goal of finding the most accurate number uh, to kind of base everything else upon. Uh, yeah, yeah. Once you once you split out those, those segments. You know, you can find your, your kind of VIP customers and you can retarget based on them. And you know, when you're retargeting to that audience or, bi- or building those custom audiences, you know that you're expecting this audience to be worth quite a bit more. Mm-hmm. And then you've got those maybe lower value people who you think, well, potentially you can't acquire, you can't target them because their value is so low. You know, maybe that, that purchase is profitable, but they don't come back. Um, they, they spend kind of the minimum order value uh, for free shipping, for example. Um, and you might find you actually struggle to to actually target those people specifically. And also you might not want to. You know, if, if those people literally come in and spend $50 and that's it and never come back, you probably don't want to spend time act- actively acquiring those customers. You want to spend spend time on the um, on the valuable customers. Yeah. That's where it does it does get a bit difficult because, you know, with things like, recency and frequency um and even that monetary side you you don't necessarily know off that first purchase what someone's going to be in the future um particularly for e-commerce you know for for some other things where uh some sort of some apps like subscription apps um and the gaming company I was at we could predict uh future lifetime value based off those uh, I think it was first 7 days actually um, we would look at, you know, how much they deposited, how many times they deposited, um, how quickly they spent money on games and that sort of thing. And it was within that first seven days that would tell us, are they going to be a super valuable person or do we think they're just going to use their initial bonus and leave? Um, it's, it's a bit more difficult with e-commerce because those engagement numbers aren't, aren't really there. Um, you, you might be able to link in a bit of email data and things, but but that's still not, it's not related to the purchase. So it's still not a great indicator. Yeah, I think with um, a lot of these, I would call them two, 300, 400 level uh, e-commerce concepts, there begins a point where it's a little bit of art and science. uh, And a lot of it is making informed assumptions, I guess. There's probably a better technical term for it. But... um, you know, it it's and it comes down to just every business is different, and there isn't one way to you know construct a what the customer lifetime value will be, what that window should be, what the payback window should be. That's a whole other thing that we could talk about. Um, you know, and so that's kind of uh, something I, I guess I just want to let listeners know is that customer lifetime value is a very malleable thing. And it can change based upon the model you choose to run with. 
Yeah, pretty much. And, and and you've I don't think you have to be super detailed with it. Um, you'll see some models out there which will build you, you know, like fifty different segments. So I think initially, if, at least if you're initially getting into this into this modeling and haven't done it before, um, you you can keep it a bit more simple. Um, and just make sure you know, you know, who are those who are those brand new customers? Um, who are your loyal, engaged customers who are buying from you frequently and and a lot? Um, who are the people who have come in once and never purchased again? Have they been given the right, the, the same experience and the right experience? Um, you know, it's worth looking into things like, are people engaged with newsletters? You know, if, if you've got a load of people who, uh, are not subscribed to your newsletter and they've made one purchase and never come back, you know, it's, it's difficult to, you know, you're going to have to pay to bring them back. But it doesn't necessarily mean they're not going to be a valuable customer in the long term. It just means they didn't want to sign up for your newsletter in the first place. But then there are better ways to get people into that newsletter than just putting a like a checkbox in the checkout saying, uh, yeah, yes, I'll opt in to hear about promotions and things. And, and better ways of doing it than just pop up on the screen saying, do you want 10% off? Submit your email address. Um, you know, I could go into a lot of detail of this, with this. There are other people out there who go on about this a lot, but you know, at the end of the day, if, if you just capture an email address for a newsletter, you know nothing about that customer. Um, so you can't, you can't personalize the experience to them at all. Uh, you can't segment them to, into different flows. You're not capturing any data there, which might tell you whether they're a potential VIP or not. Yeah. So in addition to the, the kind of RFM modeling and stuff you need to do to, to kind of track those use, those customers as they are purchasing, there's loads more you can be doing on the, on the newsletter and engagement side. Um, to actually turn people into engaged uh, loyal customers as well. Awesome. Yeah, that's a fan- fantastic uh, transition there. Um, but uh, I just kind of wanted to repeat something you just said that you know there are some there are some people and 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 th- and models out there that will kind kind of come up with like fifty different segments, and I think that is overkill for the typical SMB. You know, I think keep it simple, stupid, the kiss model. Like you know, you just need a handful, a couple. Uh, to really maximize what you do here, and then you know it really only makes sense to get that granular at scale, and you're you're probably nowhere near there yet. But you can also build them out, right? So you build out, I don't know, three. Let's let's say, for example, mm-hmm. um, I don't know. It might be you've got I'm your a big fan of three. Love, I love, yeah. <laughs> I love the number three for all all kind of just strategies and tactics. I think three is is perfect. Yeah, and once you've got those three. Once you've kind of worked out what that is and how it's working and the marketing automation that goes into it and, and how you, how you treat and manage those customers, start building out extra segments, right? It, it doesn't have to be, I think something that scares people off is the idea that these, these models have to be huge from the get go, mm-hmm. right? And they've got to have all these segments and they've got to be able to work out all the different emails and touch points that these people might have. And it sounds a bit overwhelming. So I think it's, you know, I, I don't think there's anything, I, I think some people will say otherwise, but I don't think there's anything wrong with breaking it down to a few kind of bite-sized chunks, dealing with those first, and then kind of progressing from there. Absolutely. And you kind of touched on this a few minutes ago, but you know, if someone listening is like, all right, I'm, I'm, I'm all in on this will, what are the three audiences I should build? So, well, so you're going to have that list of that kind of newsletter list. I say mm-hmm. newsletter list. I really need to stop saying that because I hate it. Uh, the kind of lead list. I suppose. Okay. Um, so these would be the, would these be prospects that haven't purchased yet? Pe- people who haven't purchased. Okay. So that's how you if we're using Clavio as our tool here, that's how you'd segment it out. I suppose uh, uh, what I'm there's different segments that okay. we need to deal with. <laughs> so, now I'm, I'm just confusing it. Uh, yeah. So in that lead list, I wouldn't want to have one. I wouldn't want to have that as one segment, right? That needs to be split into something somehow. And that will be, that's where I was, that's where I mentioned how the email address on its own is a bit pointless, right? So when you're capturing the data, you should be asking some questions at the same time. What are people interested in? When do they want to buy? What's, what's important to them with these products? Um, because when you can get that, some of that sort of data in, you can then segment that, that lead list into, and it might just be two or three different automations, three or four different automations, um, that then focus on those pain points. And, and take into account that data. Um, and that will help you communicate with people, not exactly on a one-to-one basis, but on a more, a more personalized basis because you've taken into account what they've told you. 
and then you're communicating to them based on that. Okay. Going back to the three, um, you've got your new customers. So people who have made that first purchase, making sure that they really have a good experience is really important. Um, that first time. So, and I mean, it's, it's something I'd suggest with anyone, every customer anyway, after a purchase. But I think it's particularly important that when people make this first purchase from you, you deal with any kind of anxiety and, and, and questions that they might be facing. So it's really important to let them know about shipping and delivery and things like that. So as soon as they make that purchase, try and put some tracking information in front of them or say, look, here's your unique tracking link. Um, tell people to get in touch with you if they do have it, have any questions. Uh, what I like to do is reach out to customers shortly after they have, uh, received their order as well. So get in touch with them. Um, that can be automated as well. It just need, needs to be automated a little bit after fulfillment. Just check in on, check in on them. Uh, did the product arrive on time, you know, in good condition? Was it as expected? Is the order actually what they wanted or is, you know, maybe something missing? Do they have any questions about how to use it or care for it? Or, you know, it depends what the product is, but, you know, be proactive about it and kind of jump in there. And because not only can you solve any problems that the customer might have, but also you just create that kind of good feeling, that engaged feeling with someone. If, if they know that the brand has actually reached out to them to ask if, if they have, have any problems. And another plus side of that, of course, is when it comes to the review that you're going to ask for them in maybe a week or two later, they feel a bit better about you anyway, because you've reached out. So happy customers potentially are now just even happier customers because you've made that effort. But the customers who have problems, if you've managed to fix those problems, they are now going from a one or two star to a four or five star review. Absolutely. So there's so much benefit to doing that. And that does apply to obviously any customer at any point, you know, they could buy from the 50th time. Um, I think I saw, there was a stat I saw the other day, 80, 80 something percent of customers say they will abandon a, a website that they're loyal to if, with, I think, two negative experiences. And if it's it, two or three, if it was their first time buying from a business, they would abandon that. It was something like 95% of people would abandon mm -hmm. the business with one negative experience. So if you mess it up after that first purchase, they're gone, right? You can fix it and turn that negative experience into a good experience. But if you leave it and just leave it as a negative experience, then they're gone. And yeah, even your loyal customers, they might let you off with two. And then that third one, they're gone. But you you can't use that as a stat and say, oh, you know, we've only got two strikes on this person. So uh, they'll, they'll stay with us. You know, it might be that first one that causes them to leave anyway. If you're struggling with scaling your sales, maybe Electric Guy can help. Our team has helped our clients generate millions of dollars in additional revenue through our unique brand scaling framework. You can learn more about our agency at electriceye.io. That's E L E C T R I C E Y E.io. Mesa is the easiest way to integrate any top e-commerce app or service with your online store. Designed exclusively for the Shopify ecosystem, yes, that includes Plus, Mesa's automated workflows can get back your time spent on repetitive tasks while growing your business all at the same time. Join other merchants that have embraced the simplicity of Mesa's no-code approach to building workflows. You can create new ways to improve customer engagement, encourage repeat purchases without lifting a finger, reduce manual data entry, and much more through a simple point-and-click interface. And with Black Friday Cyber Monday planning around the corner, now is the time to ask the question, is my online store prepared? Optimizing every step in the shopping experience the only way to create a lifelong customer. Get Mesa and capitalize on one of the biggest commerce events of the year. Visit getmesa.com slash honest for a 14-day free trial. That's G-E-T-M-E-S-A dot com slash H-O-N-E-S-T. Our partner Rewind can protect your Shopify store with automated backups of your most important data. Rewind should be the first app you install to protect your store against human error, misbehaving apps, or collaborators gone bad. It's like having your very own magic undo button. Trusted by over 80,000 businesses from side hustles to the biggest online retailers like Gymshark, Gatorade, and Movement Watches. 
Best of all, merchants like you can get one month of automated Shopify backups for free by visiting rewind.io slash honest. That's R-E-W-I-N-D dot I-O slash H-O-N-E-S-T. Hey, everybody. Do you want to win back valuable lost time for your support team? Gorgeous has machine learning functionality that takes the pressure off small support teams and gives them the tools to manage a large number of inquiries at scale, especially during the holiday season. Gorgeous combines all your different communication channels like email, SMS, social media, live chat, and even phone into one platform and gives you an organized view of all of your customer inquiries. Their powerful functionality can save your support team hours per day and makes managing customer orders a breeze. They have allowed online merchants to close tickets faster than ever with the help of pre-written responses integrated with customer data to increase the overall efficiency of customer support. Their built-in automations also free up time for support agents to give better answers to complex product-related questions, providing next-level support, which helps increase sales, brand loyalty, and recognition. Eric Brandholtz, the founder of Beard Brand, says, We're a seven-figure business, and we have essentially one person on customer support and experience. It's impossible to do it without tools like Gorgeous to help us innovate. Learn how to level up your customer support by speaking to their team here. Visit gorgeous.grsm.io slash honest. That's G-O-R-G-I-A-S dot G-R-S-M dot I-O slash H-O-N-E-S-T. Businesses are the most successful when they own their own data, customer relationships, and their growth. That's why more than 50,000 e-commerce brands, big and small, trust Klaviyo to deliver their ideal customer experience. Klaviyo is the ultimate e-commerce marketing platform for online brands of all kinds and all sizes. With email automation, SMS marketing, list growth tools, and more, you'll get everything you need to build strong relationships that keep your customers coming back. If you're tired of relying too heavily on paid advertising or third-party marketplaces for your sales success, you're not alone. It's time to take back control of the customer experience. More and more online businesses are moving to Klaviyo to grow higher value customer relationships through personalized email and SMS marketing. And the results are staggering. Ready to drive future sales and higher customer lifetime value with a marketing platform built for your long-term growth? You should get a free trial of Clavio over at clavio.com slash honest. That's K L A V I Y O dot com slash H O N E S T. So I'm listening to everything that you're saying here and I'm trying to just boil it down to the most simple concepts. So what I'm hearing from you is is the three segments if you're gonna start modeling out customer lifetime value. Uh, and, and and this kind of goes in hand with marketing. So the first segment would be non purchasers yet. So it's harder to kind of attribute lifetime value to them unless you have extra data. Uh, but that would kind of be the first bucket. And then the second bucket would be first-time purchasers or single purchasers, however, whatever you know label you want to put on it. And then the third bucket would be uh, repeat purchasers, which also could probably you know be your VIP customers. Um, is that kind of the, the, the mindset you want to get people in when they're thinking about this? Yeah, I, th- I think at a, at a basic level. And then, like I said earlier, you then build out those segments. Yeah. So when you've got those repeat customers... Then you start looking at, right, VIPs, the guys who come in and spend like loads of money every single time they purchase. Um, you might have people who come in and buy quite frequently, uh, but at a low value as well. You know, it kind of depends on the store, the, the range of pricing and things. So you kind of need to work out how you deal with these people and, and the experience that you want to give them. Um, you might want to find out why people uh, buy really frequently, but at a low value. And then, you know, it, depending on your business, because everything depends on the business, really, uh, you might find that there's more value to you and the customer if actually they make less frequent purchases, but at higher values. I'm going to ask you a very leading question. How would you find out the answer to that question? How would you find out why they're buying frequently at low values? Ask them. It's that simple. You know, it, it kind of links back to what I, what I was talking about with the, that email capture and asking additional questions. Those are questions on a form that you're just going to ask people to, to press an answer on. But yeah, if you're, if you're looking at a segment of customers and you don't really understand why they're behaving that way, just ask them. Um, you can do it quantitatively or qualitatively. Um, I tend to do a bit of both. I'll send out a survey 
um, ask a bunch of questions, you know, five, ten questions at most. Um, normally takes them three, four minutes to complete, which is nothing really. Um, less time depending on the questions, obviously. But I always end the survey with, um, are you happy to, would you be happy to speak to a member of the team about your feedback? And then ask them for an email address. And you get, you know, you'd be surprised how many people are willing to fill in the survey and say that they'll speak to a member of staff without any incentive. Yeah, that's kind of the point I wanted to get across here is people are scared to to ask people for feedback, which is surprising to me because it's like the it's a shortcut to making your business better. Yeah, you can make your business better. You make their experience better, um, which is just better for everyone, really, isn't it? Um, yeah. You know, there are businesses out there who don't use review tools because they're worried about the negative feedback that they're going to get out there, right? But if you're that worried about the negative feedback and that worried that you're not going to have a good score on Trustpilot or Reviews.io or whatever, uh, you've got issues. Yeah. That either means you're just really insecure about it, which you just kind of need to get over, uh, or you know that the experience is not great. And you, you're expecting, you are genuinely expecting bad reviews, in which case either stop completely or, um, or speak to customers and fix it. All right. So we're talking about gathering more data points here. And obviously when you're, when you, when they make a purchase, you're, you know, not cheating. You're just, you're getting a lot of cool stuff at that point. You know, you've got their zip code, you got the product that they want, you know, either discount code if they've used it, like where they came in, even find out like what marketing channel they heard about you, like after the purchase, all that stuff's a lot easier to find that data and start segmenting after they make a purchase. But. What about before they've made a purchase? Rumor is the more form, the more fields on a form for like a say a pop up on your website, um, the less likely people are going to convert. You know, is there another approach to gathering this extra data from new subscribers? Yeah, with two with two clients at the moment, we're running a single page form or a single. Uh, I suppose it's a page, but obviously it's not a full page. You know, it's just a normal pop up. Um, with, uh, one of them is two questions, uh, email address and a, a pain point question related to the product. Um, we get pretty much exactly the same conversion rate as if, uh, as if we just asked for the email address, right? So that one question, no negative impact. I think on mobile, actually, it has a very slight increase as well. Um, with the other client, we're asking about four, maybe five pieces of information. And again, there's, there's no downside to it. Um, we're, not, we're not seeing a decrease in, in conversion rate on the form. But also, I suppose what's important to know is that conversion rate on the form doesn't really matter so much. You know, if, if that. And why is that? Because it comes down to that customer lifetime value piece again, right? You could get 10,000 people through a form with just an email address, right? Or you could get maybe a thousand people. But you've asked them three questions that allow you to personalize the emails to them. It's highly likely those thousand people are going to be worth more than the 10,000 people in the long run. Yeah. Because you're personalizing the experience to them. So, you know, if we were going to put math behind this, the, you know, the conversion rate after the fact, and this is me making assumptions and you can hopefully I'm, I'm correct with my assumptions is, you know, let's, let's use the example email pain point. Now you're, they signed up for the list and you are speaking to that pain point in, in every part of the welcome series or retargeting series that you're hitting these people with. I'm guessing that those click through rates and conversion rates from those efforts are higher than, um, the, what is it called? The test list or the, the non segmented list? The, yeah, the control list for them. That's the, the word. Segmented list. Yep. Uh, yeah, we see better, better rates of engagement in email, better conversion rates. Because every email is, I mean, this is just one piece of data as well. You know, I'm, I'm sure we could be asking for, for more. Uh, well, for the, for the, one of the other clients, it's, uh, we're asking for several pieces. Um, but yeah, you see better conversion rates, um, better lifetime values because you're, you're addressing their pain points in, in all those emails to them. And so every time you do that, it's answering those questions for them around whether this product is right for them. Or whether this business is right for them. And that's, that's going to help convince them to purchase over an email, which just says, here are some products. Absolutely. Have you, uh, have you started experimenting with, uh, 
kind of like the quiz driven uh, acquisition of emails and stuff? Um, it's, it's what I'm trying to move into. Um, at the moment, the, the tools we have are single page, um, mm-hmm. which makes it more complex, but one where, uh, one client we're working on that with. Um, so we've, we've recently redone the form to ask for multiple pieces of information. And the next stage is how we're we building out that kind of multi step, um, flow, which is kind of like a quiz. Um, the ideal situation would be that at the end of that quiz, we will point them to, uh, a page, a page of specific products for them. Mm-hmm. Um, if we can't do that initially, then at least we've captured the data. Yeah. Um, if you haven't played around with it and this is, uh, not an endorsement, it's just this product does work. I've used, I guess, I don't know. Maybe it is an endorsement. They're not paying me. Um, the octane.ai, uh, product recommendation slash quiz thing is phenomenal and it integrates like, directly with Clavio and drops all those data points into the customer profile. Uh, it's, it's pretty sweet. I think I came across that the other day. I, I've, oh, I've recognized the name nifty. a few times, but yeah, I can, yeah. I can intro you to a, a rep over there if you're curious about learning some more stuff. Yeah. Definitely. Um, but so what I've learned about the quiz angle is it's really useful if you can think about it from the perspective of like, I'm in the store, like I'm a salesperson. What questions would you ask, like the person standing in your store, to help get them to the products that they probably want? And then you build it out that way, and it just gives you this wealth of knowledge that you can then use to segment and target the customer in the way that they would like to be spoken to, and show them the products that they are definitely interested in. I think there's slightly different data you get from that um, when you're pointing people towards products as opposed to capturing data about a customer. And their kind of buying behavior. Both have both have their uses, mm-hmm. but yeah, I wouldn't I wouldn't necessarily use the quiz based data in this exactly the same way um, as the other questions I'd be asking. Uh, just because this, yeah, the, the quiz is kind of designed just to go here is the the one or maybe here's three products that we'd recommend to you. Whereas I'm trying to get an idea with the with the email collection and that segmentation. I'm trying to get an idea of like who they are, what what they what they're interested in, uh, when they're looking to buy, and that that sort of information that will help me then tailor the tailor the experience going forwards. Whereas the risk with the quiz is you've you've narrowed it down a little bit a little bit too much almost uh, to get them to that product there and then, but it might mean that if you stuck that into your email system, you'd basically be recommending them the same product that they've bought every time. It's not exactly like that. I'm, I'm thinking yeah. I'm being a bit extreme with the example, but no, I re- yeah. I respect I respect uh, kind of the what you're pointing out there is you can't rely. What I'm hearing is you can't rely on a tool to solve a strategy problem. Like you still need to think about it and understand your customer and make sure that it just plainly makes sense. Like think about it from all the angles. Yeah, exactly. Awesome. So, you know, as we kind of dive down this this path of tools, uh, you know, is there anything in your arsenal that you guys love using on all your client stores or that you recommend people use to try to kind of get some of this data um, or try to calculate a lifetime value? Um, anything that comes to mind? I do a bit of analysis in Excel. I know I'm not supposed to do that at scale. <laughs> but... <laughs> I, dude, the, the Google Sheets and it, slash Excel, it's just the, it's the most powerful software out there and there are there are hundred million dollar businesses out there that are still run on excel yeah it's it's i suppose it's not not really to do the segmentation and stuff it's more um it's more when i've i'm interested in looking into a specific piece of data um i, I will i will export order like order data and stuff and just review it in excel um i suppose for rfm um the one that pops to mind is reveal by omniconvert um, which I believe is a free plugin for on Shopify. Yeah, I, I'm pretty sure it is. That's that's a really good one for the RFM data. Um, they will also tell you a few things like uh, uh, what's it called, uh, like days between purchase, day, days to next purchase. That's the one, um, which will help you get an idea of when your customers are next likely to purchase, and when when you might want to be then kind of getting in their inbox, nudging them a bit. Mm-hmm. But yeah, they're, they're really good. It's, it's a really easy tool to use. It's, it's pretty simple. They will give you quite a lot of segments. So it's easy to kind of look at that and get a bit overwhelmed and think, well, what do I do with all these segments? So you kind of need to 
I guess not worry about that too much and just focus on that. They've got like core segments or core, um, uh, like user groups. And then there's sub segments in each one that make each one up. And now can you, can you integrate those with your, uh, ESP? Yes. I believe it's straight into Clavio. Um, I can't remember the integrations they have. I, I, I would go, go check it out. It's on Shopify. Yeah. Um, and obviously have their sites. I'm, I mean, no one, no one's going to email you like, you lied to me, Will. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. I can't remember about the integrations. Uh, that's fine. Um, man, we just, we just dove down the rabbit hole today with uh, customer lifetime value. Is there anything that I forgot to ask you that comes to mind that you want to share? I suppose just generally to sum up a little bit, like, I think you really need to be focusing on what the customer wants at pretty much every touch point. What is it at every, every stage, every page they come to, what is it that they might be wanting to achieve on that page, um, as an individual page? Um, and how do you give that to them? So if they're on a product page, are you giving them the information they need to decide whether that is the right product for them on the, the, the checkout page? Are you giving them information about different checkout options, um, payment options, shipping options, that sort of thing? Post purchase, are you keeping them fully informed uh, about the the progress of their order? Are you making it easy for them to get in touch with customer service? Um, that's another one I really hate when businesses seem to actively make it difficult for you to contact them because they don't want to deal with customer service inquiries. Um, they would rather point you to an FAQ or a chatbot or something. Like if, if someone wants to get in touch with you, um, just let them. Right. Give them, give them a few different options. I should say test them and see what works. I have heard a few people saying that live chat has had a negative impact on the business. Right. So that might mean don't use live chat for them. It also might mean are they using live chat correctly? Mm. Um, so that's, it's complex. I don't want to get into it yeah. um, too much. Uh, but, uh, yeah, focus on the customer, give them what they want. Um, post purchase, make sure you're, Make sure the customer is happy before you ask for anything, mm -hmm. right? That's that, that's a post purchase experience I was talking about earlier. Follow up with them, check in on them, be pretty pretty sure you're happy that they're happy. Then you can start asking for reviews, referrals, that sort of thing. Awesome, that's great. Uh, so if if people that are listening, um, you know, they're intrigued about what you have to say and what you have to offer, where where should they go? How can they hear more about you? How can they learn more about working with you? Uh, best place is LinkedIn. Uh, just Will Lawrenson on LinkedIn. Um, I, I'm fairly, I'm pretty active and responsive on there. I post a lot of content. I, I'll happily, happily chat to people, message people there. Uh, I'm trying to be more active on link, uh, on Twitter as well. So that's just Will Lawrenson, uh, as well. Um, but yeah, better, best place would be LinkedIn. Awesome. Will, thank you so much for coming on today and sharing your insights. No problem. Thanks for having me. All right. I can't thank our guests enough for coming on the show and sharing their knowledge and journey with us. We've got a lot to think about and potentially add into our own business. You can find all the links in the show notes. Make sure you head over to honestecommerce.co to check out all of the other amazing content that we have. Make sure you subscribe, leave a review. And obviously, if you're thinking about growing your business, check out our agency at electriceye.io. Until next time.